One of the things that's so lovely about having made these X-Men movies now for going on, I don't know, 15 years for me, is that we have become, in real life, a little family ourselves. It's an amazing kind of ecosystem. Part of what I love about making movies is how incredibly fragile it is, far more fragile than anybody perceives, and how resilient it is courtesy of the people who have dedicated their lives to these crafts. Behind the camera, the producers of these films, the people who are physically on set in pre-production, myself, Hutch Parker, Josh McLaughlin, Todd Hallowell, we've become a family unit. I've been able to be part of a really solid working relationship with Josh McLaughlin and Simon Kinberg and Hutch Parker, and it's great. We've divvied up the responsibilities, and now everybody's just sort of permitted to do what they do well. We call ourselves the Deltas. I knew Simon Kinberg when he was a writer. Todd Hallowell and I got to know each other uh, on the first X-Men that we did, which was Days of Future Past. And I knew Hutch Parker when he was running Fox. Hutch has really become my primary partner in making these movies. He's the producer who is there from the beginning, the inception of the idea, through the marketing and publicity, all the way to its release. Hutch is also extraordinary at being a conduit um, between the filmmaking process, the filmmaker, and the studio. He knows the workings of the studio. He knows the, the psychology of studio executives. And so he's just great at predicting their re reactions to things and also managing their process because they are also partners in this. And he's just great in terms of facilitating that. Three, two, one, boom, and... Josh McLaughlin, whom we call Zulu, is sort of the field general. He's the first AD on the movie, and his role is to marshal the crew so that everybody's ready to roll when it's time to roll. All right, guys, here we go, ready. Josh is an incredible AD and does far more than what you would put under that job description. And for a production that's as complicated as these are, it's an extraordinary challenge. And, you know, Josh is arguably one of the best in the world at that. Cut. Cut. We're shooting just at that. Everything's all good. You got one wall here, one wall behind yeah. They yeah. can travel with this section, but that. That'd be great. Todd, who technically his role is as a line producer, he's worn many, many hats. He started as a production designer, so he's brilliant at managing the departments and all the budgets and helping to make sure that we have the resources we need. Todd is extraordinary at figuring out how to make movies at this scale, and he knows how to take what is a large budget for these films, but stretch it so that it looks and feels even bigger than it is. It is a special team, and it's a team that extends even beyond those four. It's a team of hundreds, all of whom have to come with passion and conviction every day for what they do in order to make it all work. You can open up a little bit of like that. Or... That's cool. And it's like handheld, kind of dirty. I see this movie as a reboot with the same cast. I think it's completely different aesthetic. I think it's a different tone. I think it's just a different movie than any of the ones that have preceded it. Part of it, frankly, is I've never directed a movie before, and my sensibility is different, and I tend to like films that are grittier, more naturalistic, a little bit more raw than these films have been in the past. There was a conscious decision to have most of the movie almost all of it handheld, which is really rare in superhero movies and very intimate, very close. We filmed in Alexa, full format, with a four by three chip, and also the use of anamorphic lenses from Panavision. Three, two, one, action guys. Anamorphic also offers you a different perspective on things, particularly in close-ups. The close-ups on anamorphic have a little bit of like coving. It's almost a, a sphere as opposed to a flat plane of what the face could be. And so those aberrations that anamorphic uh, allows creates that sort of roundness uh, to the human face. What I said to Mar, our cinematographer, and to Guy, our second unit director, was I want to use handheld almost exclusively. And even if we have crane shots, we would create these camera mounts that are handheld camera mounts on the crane. So basically, even when the crane was moving, you would have that frenetic feeling to it. The characters are moving, but also the camera is moving just a little bit so that you feel a sort of humanness, and that creates the rawness. It's just a feeling that everything has a little bit of imperfection to it. The way we, I sort of approached it conceptually was that Gene was constantly being powered by the sun, so it was more of like a lighting aspect. And also, every time she imagines her past, there's some sort of sunlight, and that sunlight is quite warm. So that warm sunlight sort of motivated her journey back to childhood. When she travels directly into her childhood neighborhood, she sees this romantic past that doesn't exist anymore in a way until 
you know, she confronts her father. And at that point, even the visual approach changes in the film. Now all of a sudden, the world turns very violent. And the camera work started to get a little bit more active and subjective and kinetic. Something that we talk about when we're on set is the dark phoenix spectrum between one and 10. One being Jean and 10 being full phoenix. So there are moments in the movie where you feel like she's out of control and you, you'll see that not just in her performance, but it'll also be with some visual effects. A little flicker of red in her eyes, a little flush in her cheeks, a crack of where you see red, almost like veins in her skin. It helped us really demarcate what that arc or de-evolution would look like and feel like for the audience. Basically on action, start the move down toward her mouth. Yeah. It's pretty, pretty slowly, like you can catch the middle of the line. Okay. Yeah. When she did go through a phase of this psychosis, we tried to psychologically with the camera move into that comfort space. We used a lens that came really uncontrollably close and sort of invaded her personal space and tried to get in her head. There's a movie from the early 90s called Clean Shaven by Lodge Kerrigan that I have to credit. It's about a guy who's schizophrenic. And one of the things that Lodge did was he created a way of shooting the schizophrenic character where he essentially dissected their face with the camera. So that in his moments, uh, really heavy schizophrenia, instead of it being a close up like this, like you have on me right now, it would be like that of him or like that. Or sometimes his point of view would be like that or like that. The camera would be showing you this much. And so we did experiments with different kinds of macro lenses where you can get super, super close to a person and just be filming their eye. And that will take up the entire movie screen. So we created what we call the Dark Phoenix Cam. We just kind of cut to little pieces of my face. It's just a really nice intimate way of playing it where it feels very invasive. It does evolve over the span of the film. It starts really small on her and then it gets kind of bigger and bigger as you feel as though Phoenix is taking over Jean. This is fully Jean at the beginning of the movie and this is Phoenix. And by the end of the movie, this is Phoenix and there's no more of Jean. And so it was just all these ways that we could dramatize, visualize this transformation of our main character. We'll be waiting here to receive Sophie. We'll stay behind her. As, she, as these guys come through, and we'll stay here. In Genosha, I use a very saturated palette. I tried to bring those colors out as much as I could, and almost like a Kodachrome. You're almost traveling back in your childhood, but this childhood is so vibrant in color. He drives with him when he drives his, when he drives with the, with the helmet. Do the same shot, but just straight on. Okay. Inside Eric's house, the patina was quite extensive. It was a beautiful sort of rust and all these different textures. And we felt like his home should still be a place that he can sort of get away from this sunlit environment. He chooses to be surrounded in this sort of steel ship. And so the elements of darkness were important there. And also for his character, that he doesn't let you in right away. There is an aspect of he needs to protect himself by that darkness. What are you? I loved the way that Mauro shot Jessica Chastain's character. I wanted her to sort of glow, so her whole aura, she kind of radiates light as she steps in the room. It's sort of ethereal light that she's surrounded with. Not only her light hair, but her skin sort of glows. We use a much more controlled camera, not active, handheld, because we sort of hoped that we'd get across to the point that she's an alien. So there's very linear camera moves, a camera on a crane, a camera on a dolly, to accentuate the fact that she had very direct control over people. And also the use of lower angles, how we're, we're constantly twisting around her. Oftentimes we've used the back of her head as you know the symbol of her entering a scene and playing the scene on the back of her head more. Nafka Ostra. Okay, okay, kia un, un nash. Every aspect of the aliens, I wanted to be as real as possible. And I created with a linguist, a language for the aliens that is obviously a fictitious language. Simon wanted it to sound predatory, threatening, and, and very alien. He wanted a language that sounded as inhuman as possible. I met with Adele initially, and she said, what do you want the language to be? And I was like, I don't know. I don't, I'm not a linguist. I can't come up with words. But this is the way I want to feel about them when they speak. I want it to feel staccato. I want it to feel hard. I want it to feel reptilian. What are the sounds that haven't been utilized or are very rarely utilized in human languages? So I came back with something that was made up of parts that exist in human languages, but that are very uncommon. There's one, like an R type of sound that's in the back of the throat that's like Rrr. We've got some hisses and also sounds that had a lot of impact. 
that we call ejectives <laughs> in linguistics that are sounds where the air is sh like forcefully shoved out of your mouth um, that kind of sound a bit like clicks, those things like like those type of sounds that make the whole thing sound arrhythmic. Dell's great because she was able to create this language and I did my first scene yesterday and it's phenomenal. I love learning languages and especially learning a language <laughs> that there's no documentation for. She's done a beautiful job creating that. With ease. The editor of this film is Academy Award winner, Lee Smith, and it's hard to describe his contribution to this movie because it is in every aspect, in every scene, and every cut of this film is Lee's as much as it is mine. I'd almost say Lee was the most important part of the larger team. I think as a first time director, even with all the skills that Simon brings to the table, there's no substitute for having somebody behind you like Lee. When Simon first contacted me about this film, we were talking about making a film about a girl unraveling psychologically as the film went on, which is an interesting framework to put in the body of a superhero film and was very appealing to me. As a technician, he's phenomenal. He's fast, his instincts are great, he's patient and thoughtful. It's quite a complicated film because it involves a girl unraveling plus basically an alien invasion on the top of it and trying to weave that through the film is a challenging process because you never want to drop one storyline in favor of the other. Hello, Jean. He's someone that thinks in terms of theme. He feels so deeply what's happening inside of each scene or what should be happening inside of each scene. I wanted it to look real, I wanted that grounded feeling that it wasn't all fluff and it was something that you could get your teeth into. Is it true? Gene killed her? He's not simply an editor who is cutting the footage that you shot for pace or for storytelling. He is someone who is a partner in crafting the story, the characters of the movie. The whole editorial process has to be about, no matter how hard it was to shoot, you have to be willing to kill it. And it is a sad time where you take out something that a lot of people put a lot of effort into. Hopefully you don't, but occasionally you do. He tells me when something doesn't feel true and honest, and he tells me when something can go deeper, and he leans in, and he also experiments. Hello. As an example, the first time in the movie that we meet young Charles Xavier and Charles meets young Jean, he comes into her in a waiting room at the hospital. And their first four or five lines are really emotional. Like, these are lines that I think almost all editors would play in a close up because you really want to see the character's faces. And I shot what's called a master shot, which was a high shot looking down at the room. And Lee, instead of using that just for the opening shot to pull Charles into the room and then you cut into the close ups the way I'd imagined the scene would be cut, he stayed in that shot for the first three or four lines. Where are my parents? <sighs> my name's Charles Xavier, and- You're dead. Aren't they? And I watched it, and at first I was like, why did you do that? Get into the close-ups, and he was like, just watch it again. Watch it as an audience member, like being carried by the scene, as opposed to anticipating the scene. And I watched it again, and I was like, wow, I, I do feel for this little girl because she looks so small in the frame. And I do feel for this relationship because they start out so far apart. And I'm feeling that much more in this high wide shot than I would be if we immediately cut into close-ups of the two of them because they would feel closer together. And there's tons of those kinds of really fairly radical, bold, I would say, choices. In the end, we're entertainers and we're in the entertainment industry. And always my hope is entertained, <laughs> never bored. You want people to have had a good time. That is wrap for tonight, and it is with a heavy heart that I say that is a picture wrap for James Ulysses Magical. Yeah. We have a picture wrap here on Ty Kale Sheridan. My best vendor, Jessica Chastain, Jennifer Lawrence. This is a picture wrap for Alexandra Ship and Nicholas Holt. If you're even the most casual fan of these films, this is the end of the X-Men as you've known them because they're facing a challenge that is different than anything that they 
or you as an audience member have ever experienced. Uh, guys, have a great rest of the movie. Have a great rap party. Have an amazing winter, because I know you all love it so much. <laughs> have a good one. We've known each other for seven years, most of us, and even the new guys that came in the last movie were all part of the family. And part of this one is saying goodbye. So you will forever remember. I have so many memories with all of these people. I met some of my best friends here. This is our fourth movie with Michael, and we never take for granted when we are able to work with such great talent. And with the utmost respect and affection, Michael, I can't tell you, man, uh, I'm so grateful that you're here, and thank you so much. Really, thank you. It's quite a poignant moment. We're filming this sort of original first-class cast, what's left of us, and now we've got a whole new cast coming through. It's nice to, in some ways, pass the baton on to them. Ever since day one, I mean, we all had this kind of novelty experience of, wow, I can't believe we're doing this, and being in the X Mansion together and seeing each other in the makeup, comic book accurate costumes. It's quite surreal, actually. It's a momentous moment in terms of these movies and also, like, real life for us, because, you know, we started making these movies, I think I was 20 or 21. Uh, this is Hank McCoy, one of our most talented young researchers. And now, from the first class generation of X-Men, it's kind of only myself, Michael, and James still remaining cast-wise. It's very sad, but also it's a strange marker in real life and in the movies. That is a picture wrap for our star of our movie, Sophie Turner. Nobody has ever, in any movie I've ever seen, given more emotionally, physically, psychologically, every single day to the movie, so thank you. I'm really, really sad, and I think I'm the saddest to say goodbye to Simon, because he's been my partner for, like, nine months now, work-wise, and... I feel like saying goodbye to him, I feel like I'm losing a bit of a limb. I don't know how I'm going to go on to my next job and not have Simon with me. It's just going to be really bizarre. I would love that people leave this movie seeing an expression of what they have felt before when they've lost control. The relatability of that I hope audiences hold on to. And I would love people to leave this movie asking, what would I do if I were simply in this family? At what point would I stop trying to help or save them? Jean lost control. But she's, she's still Jean. We can still help her. We can find her and bring her home. These movies and these characters are important to me and dear to me. And we want to deliver something meaningful and lasting to the audience and to honor all the work that's gone into these to date. I want them to get to experience these characters a slightly different way, to feel like we've taken them on a compelling journey, that they're surprised and moved and hopefully grateful for us carrying these characters forward in the ways that we do. I don't know what the future holds for the X-Men, but I approached this movie like it was the culmination of all of these movies that we've been making over the span of the last almost 20 years now in terms of X-Men movies. I felt as though this had to feel like the climax of all these movies that have come before it. Ah!